Let's rewind the clock two years back to June of 2012 when Lorenzo Haggerty and yours truly, Dr. Bruce, presented a program on the life of Terrence McKenna at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. We hosted a full house in the big yurt, perched over the Pacific in one of the most beautiful places on earth, and perhaps Terrence's favorite hangout anywhere. You can hear my talk on the life of Terrence over at Lorenzo's podcast, The Psychedelic Salon, in episode 316 titled, A Deep Dive into the Mind of Terrence McKenna. Back in 1999, Terrence and I had planned to collaborate together at Esalen in a workshop in the auspicious year of 2000. Sadly, that was not to be due to his untimely passing that year. However, Terence came to me years later saying, Get going on your own thing. So here I am, bringing some of my own words into the flowing, glowing light of that sacred space. What you will hear next, introduced by Lorenzo, is a compilation of all of my other raps spoken that weekend, which I call my Esalen Visions. Now, uh, what we're about to listen to in this podcast is a collection of several topics that Bruce Namer covered in our June workshop at the Esalen Institute at Big Sur, California. Bruce requested that his raps be uh, split out and uh, all put into a single podcast, which uh, is what we're about to hear in just a moment. And here are the titles that Bruce has given to these short talks. Are we all becoming autistic astronauts? on our dual bonobo and chimp nature, the things I loved about Terence, Esalen at 50, procreate only once and we will have a future, the wellspring of human consciousness, and Terence's greatest rap, it's all about love and where to now, butterfly hunter. I've been a collector of computer technology, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, and I have a barn crammed with vintage computers back to the 19th century, actually, some of these hand-cranked things. And the birth of the Ethernet, the birth of personal computing, all this stuff, so you can, I can watch this, this thing develop. And I can tell you that the inventors of Ethernet and the Internet in the 60s, ARPANET, and all that, compu- personal computing had no idea that it was going to become so pervasive so, so fast. And one of the things that... Um, isn't really even being studied by science is what happens if you have a human being who 300 times a day or more looks at a little box and then comes back to some other kind of consciousness and then looks at a little box, feels stimulated for the whatever it is, you know, work, thing buzzes in their pocket, the need for not feeling alone, to feel space, they look at the box, they get wrapped up in that box. Terence, in one of his talks, talks about that it was actually in Dream Awake. I don't know if you remember that that podcast, but he says, well, half the human race or a third of the human race at any one time are asleep. And a chunk of those are going into sleep, so they're going through sort of a hypnagogia. Some of them are in REM sleep. And so that is the the total consciousness of, of human beings is the wake state and the sleep state. But now there's, a, there's another state, which is the interrupt state, where you're interrupt, you're in this space, you're really completely absorbed. I mean, you can drive yourself off a cliff this way. People have these fatal car crashes and things like that. Then you come out, in and out, in and out. When you start doing this when you're two or three years old, this is a huge re-engineering of, of the human mind and consciousness. It is huge. And a person like Terence McKenna, who would sit and read a thousand books and absorb and absorb, he's like living in Neil Stevenson's Anathem planet, if you've read that that one, where it's a planet in, in the future where they, they isolate this planet and it's sort of all monks and nobody can watch media and they're kind of, they sit and contemplate ideas and they read and deeply think for their 200-year lifespan or whatever it is. And this is Neil Stevenson's like, this, the last gasp of civilization to preserve this this capability, and the, whereas the rest of the galaxy, everyone is glued to their epiphany embedded epiphany you know, retinal displays, and who knows what they're doing, but they're skipping along the surface 
of, of, of reality, and these people are sunk in the deep depths of reality. So I think that is the big story of our time, is this interrupt culture. Is, it is this, and, and you watch it happening to yourself. But can you imagine the cognitive development of, of a young person that is affected by this? And we don't even have it. We don't have wearables. We don't have embedded stuff yet, which is coming in 20 or 30 years. I mean, you read Werner Vinge's Rainbow Zand, written about North San Diego County, but it's, people have this embedded system that's directly lasering their, their, their retina, and they look out. When they look out, the world is filled with creatures and data and weather patterns and and menus and like mods you'd call them in, in World of Warcraft and and characters coming up to them and gameplay and avatars of real people and stuff and they just and in fact the fascinating thing about this book is the the hero or the and the, the non hero is a Stanford English professor who gets Alzheimer's in two thousand six. He's completely in the Alzheimer's fog, and in 2026 or 29, they bring him back. They have a they have a way to recover him, which also reverses his age down to so he looks like a teenager, a teenager with very tired eyes. You know, he's a Stanford English professor, a teenager with a real cranky attitude, but he's come into a world where he he doesn't wear, he's illiterate. So they have to send him back to junior high school. And he's like, he's illiterate. He's considered an idiot. Because he hasn't, you know, he gets the epiphany system implanted eventually. And this one young boy adopts him and then shows him how to wear, how to be literate in this new world. But I mean, these are the things that Terrence would have loved to talk about and to cogitate. And I would have loved to have these conversations. And I, we started having conversations like this because I introduced him to avatars and stuff, but the virtual world is going to come and wrap around the real world. It's going to merge and blend together. But what does this do to cognitive development? So you people out there who go into worlds through psychedelics and you see, you know, you see these fantastical rapid changing, rapid fire, you have to react quickly, you have to keep your center in the midst of this maelstrom of stuff. You know, you're in some sense, you are prepared for this, this onslaught that is coming is going to affect everyone cognitively. Everyone's going to be in this state in the future with tech, and they're going to go to the limits of their cognitive abilities. And one last little point. I'm, doing a, I'm sorry I'm doing a longer rap, but in this, working with NASA for 10 years, what happens, uh, we actually... My wife and I, uh, Galen, uh, she's done work with autistic children. Now, autistic children, one of the things, they live in another world. They live in a world of pure, raw pixels in some ways. So if reality changes and a car pulls up to a stop, there's so many pixels that have changed that it's an overload situation. They're not unique uh, in this. Astronauts, when they go outside working on the space station construction and whatnot, they have to stand down after about two or three hours of work because they have learned that with the channels, there are two or three voice channels coming into, the, into their helmet. They've got a heads-up display. They're navigating in space. Tools are floating and tool bags are floating away out of reach. Shit is happening. The sun is coming up and down every 90 minutes. Lighting is changing, and they have a really complex task list. You know, If they can't get that bolt off, then they have five ways to do it. They get cognitively overloaded, and they can black out. So like an autistic child, we all have a limit. We all have an upper range. And I think what is happening with this tech is it's pushing whatever the intent of the, the bolus of Gaian tech monster that is coming up, it is pushing the whole of humanity toward that outer limit of cognitive overload. We're just being pushed, pushed, pushed. Why? You know, why the experiment? You know? So in, in some sense, um, you know, what we've done, I mean, we've cut out all, we don't watch TV at all, period, and we don't have anxiety. You have to titrate that dose, because if you get the full dose of Fox News and World of Warcraft and blogs, and you're doing Facebook, and you're doing Twitter, and you're doing, you have your mobile phone, you have an angry boss, and you have, can you imagine? I mean, these people are so close to cognitive overload and crashing. 
Damasio talks about adrenal collapse or adrenal fatigue, and where over time you're so stimulate, stimulate response that your brain structure changes and you can no longer store and retrieve somatic memories, which is emotion, empathy, etc., etc. So everyone becomes this kind of Woody Allen movie type robotic responder, very good at doing the high speed stuff, but you can't do the low speed stuff. You can't appreciate art, you can't taste food, you can't, you know, etc., etc. So this is this is a force that is pushing all of humanity. And I think the people in this room, uh, you have some insights to offer as your fellows are pushed to their absolute cognitive limits. Ever since I was a kid, I was living in imaginal worlds. I mean, you, you saw in the movie uh, the cartoons and the planetscapes and stuff that I was drawing as an early teen and into my teens. And these worlds, I mean, it's partly from being bored at school, but they were vivid, absolutely vivid realities, a waking state. Adventures were happening, ships were crashing into each other, planets were being formed. I would draw maps that would take six months in detail. And actually, in particularly boring classes that I didn't take notes in for a period of time, I would be drawing this map of the civilization that would layer on top of itself and then I would remember what the teacher said as if I looked at a patch of the map, the whole lesson would come into my head because I'd associated what she said with these complex civilization maps. And uh, it's kind of like you get caught doodle doodling in class. But my whole, I kind of approach psychedelics from the reverse because in some ways I kind of have a psychedelic sense. I load my brain up with the hard problem for instance, there was a, a problem that NASA had. They wanted a, a concept study for how do we put a moon base together. This is a really, it's a chicken and egg problem because you can't, you can't build a moon base with people working on it because it gets too hot and cold and there's too much radiation and they can't survive. So you need a base there ready-made when they get there. But it's really tough because this equipment, no one's ever done anything. It's a chicken and egg problem. And I loaded my brain for over a year. And for Raytheon, Raytheon was the sponsor of the study, one morning it all came to me. And this vivid, this rack with all this robotics loaded into it, and it was an ion drive, and it's completely formed how to do this. And that became a, a project, and, and there's a, a History Channel segment on that for dreaming, because it came as a waking dream. And I've done this for, I do this for the, my origin of life work. But these are on the natch experiences. And if I have the right intention, you know, and bad airline coffee and Bose noise canceling headphones on a very long flight, I will close my eyes, go in, and I will pose a problem. And some of them, are, some of these natch trips are so powerful, I'm, tears are running down my face at the end of it. And I'll come out about every 30 to 45 minutes, open up the notebook, and start drawing take the notes, and then I'll close the notebook and I'll go back in. And the trip is further along. It's continued to go, and I have to kind of catch up. And then, like, I was the molecule that was being formed into a living system. And when I went back in, it was suddenly, it was out in the cold water, in, in little vessels out in the cold water, and I had to kind of catch up. And what, what lesson is being taught by this? Uh, so maybe there's a gradation of ways in. To, to these experiences. Maybe this community can do the job of, of almost creating like a chart of fine cheeses. You know, there's all these different ways to satisfy the, the palate, and, and some of them are not the medicines. And there's ways to come in, and of course, holotropic breath work and a lot of other alternatives. But I think joining these techniques together, joining Kriya breath work, with a, a psychedelic state of mind and creating combi combined techniques uh, is, is a, worthy, a worthy enterprise for our group. Just, so then, then you're not always talking, well, I'm taking something to get somewhere. No, you can get there on your own steam. Br bringing a little bit of an element of sort of fun history in here, uh, there's a story recently in a paper that really st 
struck me, or it's not who reads the paper, but the story online, and it was about the bifurcation of our ancestral line at the bonobos and the chimps. And you all know that from Jane Goodall's work and other people's work, they've discovered that chimps fight wars. You know, chimps murder. Chimps have male aggressive dominance. Well, it turns out that chimps come... So the, there was a common ancestor to, to chimps and bonobos that was in the Congo Basin. The Congo River, I guess, was forming then, and it got wide enough that it broke through this community. The south ancestors became the bonobos, and the bonobos resolve conflict by coupling, by sexual coupling, by joining together. It's, it's an amazing thing. They're sort of fading out, but they're, they're an active community. The chimps on the north side of the river, for some other reason, went into a male bonding patriarchal structure, and they, they became quite successful with this. But here's the fun thing. Our ancestor with the bonobo and chimps is before. We branched off before they branched off. So we come from stock that is both bonobo and chimp. So when you think of this, this is primal stuff, people, because look at, you know, our nature. You know, you, you talk about smoking a lot of, of pot and becoming very mellow, very sensual, very group inclusive. And you talk about knocking back caffeine or, caffeine or alcohol and going to the office, and you become cerebral and aggressive and working in male dominator hierarchies and working in competitive ways. Isn't this just sort of the bonobo and the chimp nature competing? So in, in the long view, what this probably or possibly is about is a battle between these two fundamental natures that are really, you're talking 20, 30, 40 million years of, of nature until that division. But we have both. The bonobos are sort of pure one thing, and the chips are, chimps are maybe pure the other thing, but we are a mixture of them. Now, so... If that's the case, then everything around you, maybe, you can frame in that. So what's happening at, at Esalen? You know, you're mentioning the things that are happening at Esalen. So Esalen's 50 years old this year, but there was a firing of some beloved people from the staff who have been here for years, or sort of the heart and center, by the management. Now, I don't really know the details. We, there's a site called Esaleaks, where people are putting, you know, WikiLeaks, you know. So... There's a debate about whether Esalen goes into a future and becomes a more of a, of a spa, and people are saying all this yoga, and it's, there's BMWs in the parking lot, and it's rich people, and this, the pull to pull toward the spa, the pull toward uh, profitability. And this is a nonprofit organization, but there's a certain kind of mindset that comes in, and, you know, you know things are not dirt, they're too dirty, and we want them polished marble this and we need a new bar and that kind of thing. This is what spas is. This is what Ventana is like and Post Ranch and all that sort of stuff. So this pull. Uh, and so maybe Esalen was more of a bonobo place but it, we have a chimp nature and as management and as people change, this chimp nature comes in. And so there's a fight even here at Esalen about what the future is. So all of humanity may be engaged in this in this struggle, and yet it's it's all within us. We each have the bonobo and the chimp inside, and so each what each of us personally. And in comes tech, and tech is the ultimate in the two-edged sword department, because it can slice and dice. It, it can allow you to create Burning Man. Burning Man would never have come about without the internet. Burning Man is an emergent phenomena. People come, they build their camps, they. They, it's a phenomenal thing, and it allows people to uh, get in touch, I think, with their bonobo nature more, to get rid of the tech, to get rid of all that aggressive work and that cubicle the cubicle air, blow it out of their lungs. Uh, but it, it came through tech. Um, and so then you have all these, these substances and psychedelic substances and non-psychedelic substances and controlled substances and non-controlled substances that are changing our personality or they're calming us down or they're, they're uh, solving headache problems and there, there's this chemical onslaught is occurring. This tech onslaught is also occurring. And in there 
are our children and our grandchildren that are just in this massive onslaught of cell phones and and this stuff, and they're now trying to navigate. So it's way, this thing is way bigger than psychedelic questions. Psychedelics are, they are, they are in a sense the clearest magnifying glass on the problem. It probably is ever, and they are like laser-like on this problem. But the whole of human civilization is fighting this one. And in some sense, as more tech comes in, more chemicals come in, more work frenzy, more anxiety, more pushing back. Because you can see the young generation that push back. They don't watch network news and stuff like that. They're creating their own freaking media. And it's it's vibrant, it's powerful. They're saying, that's, that's shit stuff. We don't watch Fox TV. We have our own. We make our own stuff. So they push back. And, but it's a huge, this is a huge, huge struggle. And at the same time, this wonderful thing called science is saying to us, guess what, monkeys? We figured out where you come from. Bonobo and, and chimp, look. And there's still some bonobos left. You can actually go and study them. And that's part of your ancestry. They're, they are part of you. That's a potential alternate future for you. And here's, here's your other guys. Or it's a blend. Or maybe you need both. And then it says, chimps, take a look. We've seen how the, the cosmos began. We're, we're about to launch a half a football sized James Webb telescope into a distant spot in space where it'll see when the universe ionized, when, when electrons first formed around nuclei and you could see the structure of the universe 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Chimps take a look at that. What an amazing time. You know, it's all happening at once. And I think of it as kind of like a great crescendo. All the in a crescendo in an orchestra, all that's when the instruments all play at once. It's like when everybody in the orchestra gets to do their thing. All the, the chorus gets to everybody gets the chance to play at once. And this is the time we're in. Everyone's playing at once. And after a crescendo, what happens is the, the composer decides what they want to do. It's this enormous explosion of all the voices, and then there's one instrument left at the end. It could be the oboe. It could be a sort of a, a sad sort of pastoral sound. It could be a, a voice of hope. So there will be one instrument that comes out of, of this crescendo. But in some ways, I, I wouldn't sit here feeling bad or anxious or torn apart about this. It's a glorious time. A species, species probably don't go through these kinds of crescendos more than a few times in, in their existence. And this is one of them. So if 2012 is anything, it's about that. And I would say, you know, what I'm trying to do, I know what Galen's trying to do, we're trying to expose ourselves to as many of the scenes that we can. You know, we go to all kinds of weird conferences of academic studying origin of life, space weenies that are launching private vehicles, and we go to a military think tank thing. And then we go to a music festival, and we go to... Bulgarian grandmothers eating yogurt in their kitchens, and the, the you know the, the Mong Hill tribes of go everywhere. Everyone experience this great crescendo and absorb it. I go to Pakistan, you know, I get in natural gas powered vans and we bump up into the 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 tribal area, the northwest frontier province. You know, go and talk to those people, get their point of view, you know, because they're in they're in a hot spot, and you find they're the most incredibly hospitable, uh, decent, trustable people in the world, the, the Pashtuns. So this crescendo is, is, is happening. And I think don't stay in one corner of it and develop a worldview, a defensive worldview about it. Go out and, and, and do the ultimate in trip exercise, which is to be in the skin and in the shoes of many other people and see the world from their perspective. It's a kind of a Canadian approach. I'm a Canadian. So it's a Canadian approach is to get inside the skin of your conservative relative. Get inside the skin of a Pashtun tribes person and see their world. It's actually, if you can do this and if you can reabsorb who they are and try to see the world the way they are, that's one of the most ultimate trip experiences I've ever had. Like I, myself, I put myself on the shelf and now I'm inside of Naeem and I now understand Naeem's world. It is so refreshing, it's so powerful to be inside that other person. And perhaps somewhere in there is a way 
then to talk to that person if you truly uh, have stepped in their shoes. So it's a bit of a long piece, but maybe that's um, the bonobo and the chimp, and both are beloved. I mean, both are powerful, both are, and they are ours, that we are them. We can see them in the wild and how they split apart, uh, but we, uh, we have both of them. And the, the, the monkeys are pretty darned impressive. They're doing some amazing things. But I just want to acknowledge, um, again, that we're, we're here to, in a sense, conjure this, the spirit. We did a lot of work on Terrence McKenna this morning, but it was often sort of about his personal life and revealing more about that, his humanness, pulling down the cartoon. But I wanted to sort of swing back and say the things for me personally that I just absolutely loved about uh, Terrence. And one of, I'm a sort of cosmology geek. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the origin of life, but I'm interested in the origin of everything. And there's, there's a, a, a cadre of cosmology geeks around the world. And these are crazy people, some with training and some without. And I, I, have, I need desperately more training. But they try to figure out from the, the simplest possible model for the origin of the universe and how that, with, from some very simple rules, and you remember chaos theory and Ralph Abraham, he talked about from simple rules beget, you get these really complex behaviors. This is Stephen Wolfram's ideas and Chris Langton. But can you come up with a, a simple way the universe began with a few little twists, and that's the only twist you're allowed, and can you unravel everything from that point to the matter, the emergence of star systems and organic molecules and planets and life and then consciousness as a smooth transition? I've been working on one of these models for the last two years. I call it the golden universe. It's based on the golden ratio. But why I love Terence was because he inspired this. He, he would go on you know, several long raps where he would talk about concrescence of novelty. You talk about complexification. He would start from the Big Bang. He poo-pooed the Big Bang and thought it was ludicrous in some of his arguments. But then he would you know, own it again. And then he would just in literally in a minute and a half, he would take you all the way up through in the most beautiful poetic language through the organic molecules and the self-assembly and the, the swimming creatures and the, the emergence of things on land, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to us and then our being insight. And so I just loved that. And it's inspired about 10 years of work. You know, one of, one of the, um, he was also a geek about space flight. And we had long conversations about, could you mine asteroids? And look what's happening now with these billionaires who put together this, this whole consortium to do that. I'm not sure how far they're going to get, but it's, you know, he would just love the fact that we're, we're, that human beings are still thinking about these visionary projects, despite everything else that we're doing you know, wrong or the time we're wasting on other things. And I just want to acknowledge, maybe before we take the break, that maybe something personally with you, whether it be an idea or just an approach to living, what, what really deeply reached you from Terrence that you've continued to work on in your life, whether it be an intellectual pursuit, and I know where you're, you're, you've gone since then, but um, and it's just um, in an appreciate. It's, it's a, in an in an in appreciation moment, and then maybe we when we come back after the break, is that something we could? You're the boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> I thought there was no one in charge. <laughs> okay, that's the scary, scary part. It's it's scary to be in charge. You don't want to be in charge. Uh, thanks. Uh, something is going on here around this workshop that I thought it was important to, to share with you. The, the moment that I arrived, or Gail and I arrived and we checked in, someone came out and said, oh, you're the McKenna workshop. And there's a whole buzz about this here. Now, the backdrop here at Esalen, of course, is there's this kind of struggle between the management and there's this huge psychological struggle that's going on. And it's funny because I thought, you know, we're doing this workshop at a critical time. I mean, two weeks ago there was, on ESSA Leak, somebody was calling for barricading the entry to this place. And there's a group of nine people who have been protesting and meeting in circles. 
by the pond, and it's heavy what's going on. And what we're doing, I realized sort of, we scheduled the movie as an open program a year and a half ago when I put the submission in. We'll do, of course we'll do an open program and it's gonna be, and then it became Ken, Ken Adams' movie. There's such a buzz about this. The kitchen staff are coming, the front people are coming, management people are, are coming, and somebody just just told me that, look, you know, this is back to the tap roots of how Esalen started, the human potential movement. You guys are referencing, you know, the human drama, the human, the human circumstance, history, uh, the future of civilization, uh, inner vision, you know. Um, no pressure. So, no pressure. <laughs> but we're, these words are echoing again at Esalen, and I asked John, you know, this wonderful guy, John, that, that, run, that helps set up all the workshops, he said, yeah, you know, when Stan Groff left here 10, 12 years ago, it all went away like a flock of birds. And I said, well, what's been going on here since? And he said, well, we do some nice needlework and some uh, and cooking classes. And I think that's a little harsh. But this is old timers sort of remembering the old, the, the incredible intensity uh, and importance that Esalen felt that it was it was server number one in the human potential new age movement. It was server number one. It was coming, booting up in 1962, 50 years ago. And incredible uh, people, if you read the story of this place. And it then occurred to me, I, so I asked the, the person who's attending the workshop, she's here right now, she's working at the front desk, and she said, you could propose another one. Uh, I said, well, are we too late for 2013? She says, no, 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 we're, it's pretty flexible. Why don't you send it in? Send it into Cheryl, and I said, "Well, could we expand the program? We get a little bit. We have Terrence as one part of it. Could we expand the program?" I said, "Look, if you can get 24 people, if you can keep getting 24 people in, in in programs, you can get a second program. And this is, you know, we really love this kind of, of thing. And you've included us. You gave five spots to include Esalen people in your workshop, and that means so much to us. We're almost never offered that." because the workshop presenters are worried about that extra money that they would lose. I said, well, it was, of course, it's like, it was, it was, this is done for the Esalen community as well. So there's something very special about this workshop for Esalen itself. Yeah, there, there, in sort of there's a bridging going on between the older ones that are in their kind of last workshops, and then there's kind of middle people they're trying to bridge their legacy, and we have to be able to hand it off to people in their 20s and 30s. And that's what Burning Man has done. I, I want to bring something up that just occurred to me that was in a, a beautiful Terrence uh, quote that I pulled out somewhere from a podcast last week. And Terrence asked, he said, I almost never ask the mushroom a question. Uh, but this one time I asked the mushroom, how can we survive as a species? How, how can we make it? And he got a clear answer. You should procreate only once. And what the mushroom was telling him is, you have a couple. They, the mushroom said, for a time, procreate only one time. Have one child, you know as China has done all these years. And so Terrence sort of came out of that and realized it's so simple because all these other problems are driven by one thing and one thing alone, which is increasing population pressure. You know, when I go to Pakistan, which I'm doing quite frequently these days, there you are in the Indus Valley, you know, the cradle of civilization, the oldest complex civilization, it is a total ecological wasteland, just like Iraq. And if Egypt didn't have the Nile, it would be just like that. So what human civilization does is absolutely denude the land. But what has replaced that is 180 million people that are still living on this denuded land, running out of water and whatnot. The strangest thing is, though, they're building apartment complexes, shopping malls, all the same model we have, even a country like that that's under such pressure, they are building out infrastructure to carry more population because everyone has three, four, five kids. It's just what, what they do. 
carry more population, carry more population. So the land gets more diluted, denuded. People get into the consumer. If they're in the consumer society, they're in more embedded in it. There's more machine production of food and, and goods coming out of China, et cetera, et cetera, to carry more population. So these people are now living in less hum humane, less naturalistic, more denatured environments. Look at Shanghai, you know, 500 million people out of poverty in China in the last 30 years. But what that means is they're living in 50-story apartment blocks, and they go down, and, and this is the first generation, and they go into the shopping mall on the weekend. They love it. I mean, everybody's got a smile on their face that is that I can see in the big cities in China. They're like, it's fresh and new, but they're now disconnected. They're in this machine world. They're living in this azure civilization. They've left the emerald behind, the forest behind. So if you did, if, if the mushroom was right and you said one child, one, one procreation, that means each generation you have the number of people that are pressure on the planet. And I think that we've, we've not lived in a time when this happened, but in the Black Plague, you know, Europe lost between one third and two thirds of the population. And so European cities before the Black Plague were veritable rabbit warrens of, of complex streets, lack of planning and sanitation, big overpopulation problems. After the Black Plague, they basically uh, created avenues, they created uh, sewage systems, plate glass was invented, kitchen utensils were used, all these transformations, of the, you know, the, the scientific revolution happened in the, in the fallout from the Black Plague because the pressure had been taken off, there were just fewer people, and for a moment they had tremendous new resources that they didn't, fallow lands, um, it was, it was a, it was a it was an enormous safety valve that was released. And so we don't know what it, what it is like to be in a declining population. Perhaps Denmark is in that. I don't know some European countries, but it, Italy is. But w even if you have a slowly declining population, if you have increasing consumption, it still doesn't give you the, the pressure release. You actually have to have a fairly steep declining population, which is half every generation. You could do that for four or five generation, and you'll see a regeneration of the earth and a whole lot of options open up. And a lot of wars not fought over declining resources, water regenerated. No one has to die uh, for this revolution to happen. You, you mentioned mystery experience, and I, I thought I'd offer something that kind of uh, is sort of the source of a myth for me. And it's a, it's a story that I wrote um, in a kind of reverie in the aircraft flying over Afghanistan about three weeks ago. And I was, I was uh, leaving a work assignment in Pakistan. And we were looking down at the most rugged landscape on the planet, with this spectacular landscape. Uh, and sometimes when I've, I've had that kind of profound experience as I've had in that trip in Pakistan, I just close my eyes and a whole a, a, a story comes. And so this is the story. And I think there's some things we can mine in this for the, for the, for the myth. Uh, last month I was in Pakistan. And while leaving and the airplane at dawn, we turned west from Islamabad and fl flew high over Afghanistan, the most rugged landscape you can ever imagine the graveyard of empires. Of course, our empire is well, well situated there. Uh, I then closed my eyes and was overwhelmed by a flash and a visionary journey unfolded. I will now relate to you that journey. I was with Naeem, our Pashtun cook and head of house, and he was at the wheel of the house van. We were driving out of Islamabad far to the north into the tribal lands of his family. As he is a Pathan, as they're called in Pakistan, you would trust your life to this man. This is what they're like. We left the chaos of the Grand Trunk Highway and bumped along the heart through hard scrub and villages, stopped for tea, as it's always offered, and continued higher and higher. I was tracking our progress on our iPad's GPS map. I then looked up and was taken aback by a young man in a green shirt 
appearing suddenly in front of our van. And in this kind of countryside, you don't, you know, if somebody's standing in front of your vehicle, you've got to consider what you're going to do. We came to a grinding stop. He beckoned us out and reached out his hand for my iPad, saying, that thing can't take you any further. Give it to me. His T-shirt said, Apple Genius. So I thought, well, he's the man, so must know, and I gave it up. The iPad blipped out of existence like a crashed app. In its place appeared a hand-embossed silver cup. The genius handed this to me wordlessly, and then he himself blipped out of existence. Naeem glanced at the cup and said, Get back in van. I now know where we are going. We climbed higher and higher until the van's transmission was on the edge of giving out, and we got out to walk. We seemed to walk for days, or was it just a few minutes? Uh, we passed by monkeys fighting over dry berry bushes. We heard the sound of a stream. Naeem's sandaled feet took me to the toe of this stream, where it seemed to disappear into the ground. Naeem said, this is the water that feeds the world. Feel it on your tongue. I looked down and I did not see flowing water. Instead, there was a rivulet of what seemed like cold, molten white porcelain rippling over the rocks. I bent down and put my eye just above this snake-like ribbon, and it resolved into flowing liquid tiles, clearly of the Multani style from Multan in Pakistan. Deeply etched within these turquoise bands was the lettering of the swirling, sacred Shamukati style. This is what you see on mosques when they have tiles on the mosque. Swirling, swirling, beautiful letters. I said, I am thirsty, but of this water I cannot partake. I said, looking back at Naeem. Then we move on, he said, and walked away. We lost the way of the stream and climbed what now appeared above us as a mountain. We soon dis rediscovered our water, which was now flowing wider and faster. Naeem stood back as I reached my hand into it. Cool mount molten white tiles flowed past my fingers, but this time the lettering jostling in the turbulence was Greek. Iskander, your Alexander, was here. Naim said. I said, I am now very thirsty, but of this I cannot imbibe. To which Naim replied, then we must climb very high. High on cliffs, Naim paused to look down at the ruins of a village that lay far below us. He seemed momentarily sad, and I asked, where are your people, Naim? My family are all gone. Your people sent a hellfire missile, and the tip found its way under the rib cage of my son and lifted him to heaven. We walked on in silence. The stream now ran fast and wide like a sheet of blank paper with an aquamarine, aquamarine border, no longer carrying words, but a human figure or a running animal would often flicker past. Rumi has shaken the rug says Naim. Come further if you can. We are coming to the source. I was becoming very weak by this time, so I gripped the cup to draw strength from it and noticed that the engraving was gone. It was now as smooth as skin. Naim stopped before me, turned, and said, Still your monkey mind. The source lies behind me. The upwelling source was a pure white liquid brilliance the milk of the earth. No mind inscribed it. No beliefs colored it. It was pure emotion, pure love, and pure consciousness in one. It was the coming to full awakening of our ancestors before they descended into history. I looked into Naim's eyes and saw that in him the strength and purity of that first awakening flowed still. Naim are you the last human being left in the world? I asked him. 
Drink, but do not think, he said, and I knelt down as if in prayer. So this this is a vision visionary story in honor of Terence because in a sense is it a new myth that before we had language we had some kind of unity some kind of purity before we put and we talked about this this weekend before we put symbols on things we came awake without that what was human life like? What was the human spirit like and the mind like when it was all integrated without the divisions and the taxonomy and of, of words to describe things and separate people and describe positions and hierarchies? What was it like before we had language? What We had mind and we had heart and we had soul. We did not have uh, language. And I think of this as this pure, bubbling brilliance. And this must have been an extraordinary time. Did it last a, a thousand years or a hundred thousand years or five hundred thousand years? It must have been an extraordinary time before language or as language was just coming on. But there's, there's a thought also that the language of that time was different. The language of that time was emotion. It was, it was almost like animal sounds, animal calls. It was a reflection of the of, of the natural environment, but it didn't describe culture because culture was so integral to being and to the natural environment that culture hadn't emerged as a separation from that being. So is there, this is sort of, it's not the stoned ape period because in a sense, if you were so connected to the savanna, the rainforest, so intimately connected, with no barrier, no cultural barrier, no language barrier between you, you're in a psychedelic state. You're in a stone state. You're high on that. And the haunting image that was taken last year of the undiscovered tribe in the, in the Amazon, you probably saw that. Aircraft flew over this three or four thatched huts on a slope, and they came back. Uh, nobody had a camera and they came back and they started shooting pictures and by the time they'd come back and they then they flew back it was a few hours later the men were all painted in red ochre in warrior gear and they were pointing the spears at this aircraft and the women were hidden away because they had seen the women before are these people existing in that state are they you know are they in you can read Matt Palomary's book, which kind of takes you there. You know how much, how much of a glass veil is between them and their world. So perhaps we don't need the stoned ape theory to explain the expansion of consciousness and the coming to awareness. The natural world was enough to do it. Just being in the natural world. So as soon as you 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 got a little mind and the spark of consciousness, you started to notice and to be present more and more. And the world can fill that presence. The world is powerful. You know, it's more powerful than a trip being, being totally present in nature. So our ancestors be, came to the full flowering of consciousness in that environment. And then we invented uh, all this other stuff and we descended into history. So in honor of Terence. So this, this little parable, this little story is kind of represents that. And I have to tell you, um, there's something fundamental behind this. In Pakistan, when you're in Islamabad, you're in this power center because it sits on the, the Indus plain where civilization began. And two miles north of where we stay is where the uh, Buddha sat under the tree in that very spot. But the whole place is an ecological disaster. The whole place is denuded. You'll drive for miles and then you'll come to a university and there's a single banyan tree. And it's the only one left, you know, for a hundred square miles. And it's a survivor, it's three thousand years old. And you realize this is was the garden of humanity and it's gone. And when we did go up to nor the northwest uh, frontier province, the higher you got, 
And, and this is an environment where it is the tribal world and they aren't connected, uh, but they're being rained on by drone attacks from the sky. But in, in the middle of all this is, is springs. It's, it's just fantastic. And life is still there despite the, the deprivations and the denuded landscape below and the pollution and the wars and the B-52s and all that stuff that is moving in and out of there. There's something there that is so profound. And these Pathan people who are the last survivors, they're like the jungle people in the Amazon. They're holding on. There's no electricity in their village. They're, they're living in the most hard scrabble you can imagine, but they're holding on to something that we let go a long time ago. And we, you know, that's just a thought as far as uh, my creation myth, that creation's still going on in these places. These people are still in that original state. And perhaps by visiting them and by taking ourselves into nature, it's the ultimate psychedelic high to to really be in nature and be in the earth. And, and, and that, perhaps, is what the plant medicines are telling us. They said, just go back to the forest, and, but be present, and be, be aware, and let it in, and let everything else go. Let mind go, let culture go, let this words go, all that, let it go, and just be in nature. And you'll, you'll find where, where you came from, and that exquisite time the ultimate experience of, of humanity that, that we moved away from when all this stuff got invented. So I guess that's, uh, that's my myth for the day. And this is something that Terence uh, would have most prized. And in fact, we know, uh, can you see it? If I, if I turn this way, turn this way. This is a blue morpho, and I took this, this photo uh, when I arrived in Peru in October, and I looked out from my tombo, and this enormous butterfly was sort of standing there, and I kind of ignored it. I sort of I was setting up for living there for two weeks. And I looked back, it was still there. And it had this kind of gray model pattern on the outside, but it was standing there like a sentinel saying, notice me. And I finally did, and then it would do this dance. It stayed there for over an hour. And then I realized there's a, the forest is teaching me, the forest is communicating. So I, I asked permission, can I take a flash photograph of you? And it turned this way, and so I did. And you can see these, these incredible patterns, sort of psychedelic patterns, these eyes. And then I asked it, uh, because what it would do is it would just sort of almost turn its back to you and then crack the wings. And inside was this incredible iridescent blue, as Terence would have called what he would have called the, this kind of a color. I think it's about ready to go. There we are. Can you see? Uh, I believe that this blue morpho was saying, there is the common experience of the patterns, the geometries, etc., um, of what you can experience is most often seen, but rarely seen is the opening, the full opening to this blue power. It's the power of the heart, it's spirit, it's nature, it's the world. It doesn't have the symbology, it's just pure, pure blue power. And, uh, and I think that as we've been through our own hero's journeys here, and we've been through Terence's, we sort of relived uh, a, a more, you know, full, in-depth telling of Terence's hero's journey, we realized Terence did, he did open to this blue, and that that is the promise for all of us. And in, in a sense, his final message, it's all about love, was his greatest ever rap. It just lasted less than a second or a second and a half. And it was just a few words, but that was Terence's greatest rap. And it was his, you know, his last, last one. And it's what he gave to us. And so, you know, Terence, you, you, you ordered the blue morpho in the mail when you were 11 years old and one came and it was in the butterfly collection. 
and it came from a Colombian distributor. And certainly when he was on this trek, this is something he would have wanted to get. You know, he got it in the mail, but that didn't really count, right? Um, and in fact, uh, and he did get it. He did find it. So the final, uh, I was going to do a, a little thing called Where To Now Butterfly Hunter. And I think this is what it is. So uh, just honoring Terrence McKenna and honoring his journey, and it's a model for our journeys. And uh, we have now a huge new archive of Terrence McKenna that has never been heard. So you have perhaps a couple of years of, of new. But don't forget, uh, I think, this image. Because this man, through by hook or by crook, to use an Irish expression, he made it to the, to the blue. He made it to the heart. Well, there you have it. A taste of Dr. Bruce doing his own thing, and in my own way honoring Terence, who has become a mentor of the way out tale to me. I now see that those visions, those new myths as Lorenzo called them, together with an appreciation of a departed friend, and a hopeful look back to our origins as conscious beings, set the stage for the levity zone. Fabio Scalabroni provided the uplifting oceanic Esselenic tracks from Back to the Sea from his album Quiet Place, while Jacob Amon provided the cover art, photo and intro by Lorenzo Haggerty, and recording by Tom Riedel. Thanks also to Michael Murphy and Nancy Lunny for making this workshop possible. And Terence, yes, we lay down on the grass by the big house, and took a puff or two in the very place you did too.